So I wanted to welcome uh, Dr. Christine Neff, uh, who is the Associate Professor of Educational Psychology at the University of Texas at Austin. And uh, welcome, Christine, to the Facebook Live here. And I just wanted to say just few words, and then I will really want Christine to talk more and share more about her knowledge and her experiences here. So generally, I think uh, uh, the meaning of compassion, uh, or in, in Tibetan, we say Nyingye. So the compassion is something that I think many, many spiritual tradition around the world is somehow have very common sense of uh, agreeing, um, uh, same principle, same, around the same, a little bit different, but primarily I think the focus is very much same. Within the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, I think uh, with all the tenet system, doctrine systems, uh, the compassion has always been a same agreed topic. But as when it comes to a wisdom, there's so many disagreements, so many debates throughout the centuries. So, so I think it's a, we are talking some topic which is a good, which most people agree. And, uh, but of course, uh, there's always in a Buddhist tradition, there's always been compassion to uh, others, uh, but uh, not that much of emphasis on self-compassion. I think this uh, for, for now, this topic about self-compassion has been very widely known. And I think Christine, definitely one of the well-known uh, person who also not only uh, academically speaking, but also the most important part is I think very experiential in her, in her own life, in her son Rowan's uh, situation, what brought all these experiences into a very much meaningful and, and a lively way. And I think she, I, I've listened to some of the uh, YouTube and Ted, so it was very uh, enlightening. So, so I would like uh, Christine to maybe, uh, maybe, maybe say a few words about yourself and then your personal experiences and then maybe some, your, you know, then we'll move on there with the academic and research. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Rinpoche. Ah, well, I'm so happy to be here. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I did discover the concept of self-compassion when I started practicing Buddhism. I think compassion is a central tenant um, of all religious traditions, but I think perhaps what's a little bit different about Buddhism is because this, at kind of at the core of Buddhism is this idea of interdependence, that this idea of self versus others, separateness is actually kind of not true. In a way, um, from the Buddhist position, it doesn't make sense to have compassion for others, but not for the self, because of course, the self and other are intertwined. Um, and I do think that's why it's um, a little maybe more prevalent in Buddhist traditions. Now, having said that, even though it's almost assumed in Buddhist traditions, the way I learned it, that of course you have compassion for yourself, the way most Westerners practice it, especially where there's a very strong separate sense of self, is by focusing almost entirely on compassion for others and forgetting about the self, or at least having a lot of difficulty having compassion for the self. So I think that's why there's kind of a need for it, especially in Western contexts, because it's so hard for people to unconditionally accept and have kindness for themselves. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of my way through it. I actually was um, studying with a, a, a group that, um, Thich Nhat Hanh's group in the United States, the Community for Mindful Living, is where I first learned about it. And although I no longer practice in his tradition, he talks a lot about self-compassion. So that's really where it comes from for me. Yeah. Wonderful. Maybe uh, you can speak a little bit about the kind of work that you've been doing this around three component about uh, loving kindness and common humanity and mindfulness. Maybe share a little bit well, how you came up with the uh, three <laughs> versus only one or four. <laughs> yes, yes. So, I mean, that's, so that's based on my reading of the literature. So I started he hearing about self-compassion, like I said, when I started sitting with um, a group with uh, the study Thich Nhat Hanh's tradition. But People had written a little bit about self-compassion and, and especially like Jack Cornfield's book, A Path with Heart, 
and um, Sharon Salzberg's book, Loving Kindness. And again, it was kind of an oral tradition that I was sitting with, but no one had really broken it down explicitly. And I knew that I wanted to research this concept because I had done um, work with a self-esteem researcher. And as I was practicing self-compassion in my personal life, I realized it was such a good alternative to self-esteem in terms of a way to think about how to relate to yourself in a healthy way that didn't require feeling perfect or better than others. So I knew I had to come up with a clear definition so that I could measure it. Measure it. So basically, I just read every Buddhist book I could get my hand on, and not, not even just Buddhist book, any book on compassion I could get my hand on. And from my point of view, I needed more than just the sense of concern for the alleviation of suffering, the kindness component. I mean, that one, that one was pretty obvious, right, that that had to be there. Um, and, you know, kind of the motivation to help, that's all, that's all really part of what I call kindness. But I realized that there needed to be something that differentiated a self-compassion from self-pity. You know, in Buddhism, they make a big deal of these being near enemies. Pity and compassion are really quite distinct. And what's the difference? Well, it is this notion of interdependence, right? So I knew, especially in a Western context, that I needed to include interdependence in the definition. Otherwise, I would just be talking about self-pity. So I, I actually call interdependence common humanity because I thought that outside of Buddhist circles, no one would know what I meant by interdependence. Okay. But that's really what it's pointing to. So first of all, understanding all the causes and conditions that come together in a human life to lead us to act as we do so we don't have to blame or judge ourselves as, as like the sole responsible person for our actions. Actually, we're embedded in a much larger context, which allows for some forgiveness and acceptance. Um, and also the idea that, you know, everyone is imperfect, the life is imperfect. It's not just us. This is the way human life is. So that's where I, that's why I included that component. And at first I thought maybe that was it, but then I realized actually that mindfulness had to be there too, at least from my perspective, because mindfulness is the core. In other words, we have to be able to be with suffering long enough to be able to open our hearts to ourselves. If we're caught in resistance, either you know resisting, I don't want that, it's not okay, or trying to fix it or trying to control it, or else getting wrapped up and lost in our thoughts, we couldn't be self-compassionate. So though really, I mean, this is, I suppose, my own contribution in that I don't think in the Buddhist literature I was reading, they were talking about mindfulness being part of self-compassion, but it was just assumed to be there. It was presumed that you are in a state of mindful awareness when you have compassion. And I realized, again, for kind of the Western definition, that I needed to be explicit in order to be able to measure it. So that's where my three components came from. Um, I was a little worried that I may have gotten it wrong, but luckily <laughs> people who thought about it more from the Buddhist perspective, I think they're okay with the definition. It may not be technically the way compassion is defined from a Buddhist yeah. perspective, but practically, pragmatically, I think these three elements need to be there. Yeah, I think uh, maybe uh, some sense of uh, it's not always about philosophical but it's also very much about experiential and uh, what really makes differences in people's life it might not necessarily always fit exactly with the definition yeah i understand that maybe let me ask you a question about these three component so when you um when you you thought about it you came up with this and when you are now kind of working with the people uh, in in a more experiential way so in the sequence of these three Yes. So, so does it really matter for you? Because sometimes it, it seems like a sequence matters a lot. Yes. Um, because um, what you really you're trying to do is you're working with uh, so many different individuals that they are all in a totally different places in their life, uh, how they are feeling about themselves, how they are relating to their suffering and pain. They're different places. So some people... If you tell somebody, some people to sit with your pain, that was too much to tell. Yes. And yes. if you say you, you have a little bit more compassion as you do, be kind to yourself like you be kind to your friends, oh, that's easy to understand because it yes. kind of involves personality and involves emotion, some familiar images, so they know how to do it. But sitting with pain, that's not 
nobody does it. <laughs> yes. So, um, so I think in the moment, in, in any moment of self-compassion, you kind of have to start with mindfulness in the sense that if you aren't aware that suffering is there, if you're just, you know, suppressing it or trying to think positive, you actually can't have compassion. So in the moment, I would say mindfulness has to be the first step. But in terms of training and kind of how you approach self-compassion, I think you're absolutely right. There are differences. Some people are better starting at the mindfulness. They learn mindfulness techniques. They learn to be stable with their painful experience. And then they can add in the compassion. Other people, it's just way too much to ask them to sit with their pain. They're just overwhelmed. And they actually need the kindness first before they can even be mindful. So I think that it, there are individual differences. But if you think about any particular moment of self-compassion, if there's no awareness of pain, it makes it impossible to have compassion from my point of view. Yeah. So your sequence is quite good in that way. So because first to, for most of the people, I think uh, to have like a loving kindness toward oneself, which in terms of the language, people understand very yeah. familiar with that. And then once they become more familiar with that, then, then they're strong enough, um, um, I mean, settled enough or strong enough to sit with it. But in the beginning, definitely, I think uh, it's probably if you're trying to say sit with it. And I, sometimes I do feel like a mindfulness practice is to people who are not ready is a torture. <laughs> it's a torture, you said? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I think there really are differences. So now there are multiple programs out there. I mean, the three main programs, the main program to teach uh, mindfulness, at least in Western context, you know, the non-Buddhist context is mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, our program is probably the most prevalent to teach self-compassion, mindful mm -hmm. self-compassion. But also there's um, programs designed to teach compassion for others, like compassion cultivation training. Yeah. And for some people, I think that's the easiest doorway in because they're kind of used to that. They're on board with it. They know how to give compassion for others. Then they kind of slip themselves in and then they're mindful. So I really do think they're different doorways into the same room. And it's nice that people have choices, I think. Wonderful. So yeah, since uh, we don't have so much time, I wanted to you know, make sure we take advantage of your presence here. So I think one of the, uh, the important part of you is you doing your research on self-compassion. So I wanted to ask you how many research you have kind of done in, into self-compassion and what is the most important one that you, <laughs> you, you, you have done and why you feel that's the most important, what is the most important finding in self-compassion in your yeah. view? So, I mean, the nice thing is, you know, I've just done maybe about 40 studies, but there are almost a thousand studies now on self-compassion. I can't even keep up with the literature. Every year it basically doubles. So there's a real exponential growth curve. I mean, it's, so it's amazing. Um, and it's, it's hard to say what exactly is the most important study, but I would say perhaps the one that's most influential are the studies that are coming out showing that self-compassion increases motivation as opposed to undermines it. Because in the West, the number one block to self-compassion is people think they need to be hard on themselves in order to motivate themselves. And actually it's not just the West, a lot of East Asian Confucian cultures also believe you have to be really hard on yourself to motivate change, to motivate achieving your goals. So there was a study that came out of um, UC Berkeley by um, Juliana Breens and Serena Chen, a series of four studies, um, including experimental studies showing that if you help people be more self-compassionate when they fail, they're actually more motivated, um, to, first of all, to try again, and then to keep trying and to persist in their learning. So I think that kind of was slightly the turning point because a lot of people would say oh yeah fine well it makes me happier it makes me less depressed but i won't achieve my goals we're such an achievement oriented society but now we know it will help you achieve your goals and i think that's kind of the tipping point for people um making some space for the idea of self-compassion yeah mm -hmm. okay so um, can you define exactly what's in this short what self definition of self-compassion is 
uh, from from the way you work or and then can you sell where you come with you where do you come with that definition does it has anything specifically any tradition or or just uh, just how that's how you see it yeah so again i've got there's these three components that i've divine that i've used to define self compassion and actually it's six because each component has a positive and a negative yeah. so it means i'm um, treating yourself with kindness the way you treat a good friend um caring for yourself trying to give your um meet your own needs to alleviate your own suffering as opposed to harsh self judgment which is being critical judgmental um harmful to the self so that's one component um again the second component is framing our experience in light of the common human experience in other words everyone is imperfect and everyone has an imperfect life um as opposed to the opposite of that which is actually much more common is people feel isolated when they make a mistake or when something difficult happens in their life even though logically they know that no one is perfect and no one leads a perfect life it feels like something has gone wrong you know when you make a mistake it feels like oh i shouldn't have made that mistake when in fact why not i mean what is it that's what it means to be human is we make mistakes so self compassion um really frames everything in light of the fact that this is a shared human experience. And then like I said the last one and the last component I think needs to be there at least to experience self compassion. I define it this way whether it's separate or related it almost doesn't matter. I know to experience self compassion you have to be willing to be mindful of your pain, accept it. I mean let's face it we often don't even want to acknowledge when we're in pain. we would like to think about something else or 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 else we get so lost in problem solving mode um that we basically can't turn toward ourselves like a friend we're just trying to make the pain go away so we have to be mindful as opposed to being lost in the storyline of the pain mm -hmm. and the nice thing about this definition is it leads directly into interventions for instance if you want to do an experimental study and see how self compassion changes behavior you just have people first right mindfully being aware that they're suffering a difficult moment you have them um remember that this is part of the human condition and then you have them write to themselves with kindness like they would to a good friend and that's how you kind of get people in a self compassion state of mind and you can see how it changes their behavior sure so basically the the i think you what the your uh, definition of self compassion seems like a kind of very broad uh like you're trying to include everything there but generally typically like in the buddhist tradition yeah. uh, compassion word compassion in yinge is a defined very very specific it does not try to include everything from every piece yeah, or, yeah. i think in like, buddhism it would be more just concerned with the alleviation of suffering yeah so suffering. basically it's a uh, sense of uh, may others be free from their suffering so that's the Yes. The, the willingness wantingness wishing do that people are free, may people be free from their suffering it's the what definition of compassion or ninge is and then that could be apply same way toward oneself may in a sense of deep a true uh, wish to be to be wanting to be free from one's own suffering could be yes. defined as self compassion but then uh, when you include the mindfulness i mean in the buddhist tradition sometimes you can think about uh, absolute compassion and the relative compassion mm -hmm. which absolute compassion is more where you trying or when you are able to go beyond your personality and able to uh, rest in that awareness of beyond personality and confront your pain and that's that awareness power of the awareness has ways to heal the pain if one is capable of doing that but one we said again before that when somebody is not capable of doing that then the sense of treating yourself like you have a best friend particularly when they are in pain that i think is a very very work we well no yes yeah no i think i think that's right i think you can my definition is a bit more general although i think it is true in buddhism that there is a big difference between pity and compassion And so I guess I wanted to be able to include that difference in the definition although technically you wouldn't have to right <laughs> but I think from the Buddhist perspective 
pity would be when there's not that sense of interconnectedness or common humanity, but it's more like it's an understanding in which compassion is embedded as opposed to being the feeling of compassion itself. Wonderful. So I think that's true. Yeah, mine's kind of a yeah, pragmatic definition. So let's say it this way, one, uh, maybe one part, I think, uh, is there is any, um, for sure, I can, I, I think is that there's so much uh, really like a healing, a lot of research proofs that, I mean, uh, through, through this ancient tradition, it's always been proof, it's, and regardless of these new researches or not, it's been always, it's been always known to all the people, practitioners and yogis, but now we are, with the research, it's nice, it's just confirming to ordinary people who don't have that level of uh, knowledge, trust, or familiarity. So let's say this way, is there any false downside of the, that, that treating uh, oneself, like talking about treating oneself like best friend, there are sometimes people do treat themselves too good as a result, they begin to treat others not that good. So, so some sense of uh, when the personality and patterns of, uh, of uh, self or ego, uh, yeah. or smart ego being too kind to oneself. So is, just can you say anything about the downside of that? Well, see, that's in a way why I have the other two components there, mm -hmm. right? Because if it was just self-kindness and didn't include common humanity, in other words, didn't include interconnectedness, and also didn't include mindfulness, which is kind of clear scene of what's happening, it could devolve into something where you've got maybe narcissism or it could devolve into self-pity or maybe self-indulgence. Um, but as long as all three components are there simultaneously, it kind of protects it from turning into something else, right? It can't be self-pity if you have common humanity. It can't be narcissism if you have common humanity. Because it's not that I'm better than anyone else. It's actually just that I'm a flawed human being. All human beings are flawed. This is the way it is. So that kind of helps prevent um, it from from turning into something like self-indulgent, something that it's not really. Wonderful. So again, that, that's why from my point of view, like when you measure self-compassion, it's important to include the other two components, the common humanity and mindfulness, so that you know you're measuring true self-compassion as opposed to something that looks like it, but isn't really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of the working with individually, it might be kind of a, uh... You have it's kind of uh, d difficult, right? A little bit challenging to see who is where and how they are actually. It's, I mean, it may be a little bit um, challenging, I guess, to each person has to watch yourself a little bit more if you're going in which area or you're having too, ki too kind to yourself. <laughs> it really rarely happens in a Western context. So my, my research shows that at least 80% of people are significantly kinder to others than they are to themselves. Maybe 12% are equally kind to self and others. And it's only about 7%. And I haven't actually looked at them yet. It's new data. Very, very few people are actually kinder to themselves and others. It mm. seems to go against our nature. Um, and I think there's a reason for that actually. I think it's because um, it's easier to, to help others because when others suffer or are in trouble, we aren't threatened. And when, when we don't feel threatened, we're able to give our best, we're able to be our best self, we're able to be soothing or nurturing and supportive. But when we, when we fail or make a mistake or something difficult happens, um, basically we um, feel threatened. And when we feel threatened, we go into fight, flight, or freeze mode. And fight, flight, or freeze leads to the lack of self-compassion, right? We're trying to control things. We're trying to, like when we criticize ourselves, we think actually somehow we're gonna be able to be perfect if we're just hard enough with ourselves. We, you know, we, we just fall into this, this fallacy of thinking we can control ourselves and control our lives when we're in fight or flight mode. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why the vast majority of people find it easier to be compassionate to others than to themselves because they're threatened when they fail in a way aren't with others. Wonderful. Like it's kind of a biological thing, really. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I think maybe if uh, I know like uh, Anya, uh, our uh, 
producer of hosts there will uh, share some links of your work and information. And I think she probably is doing it right now. <laughs> And uh, maybe you, if you wanted to, maybe five minutes, if you wanted to guide uh, just a short five minute meditation. Yes, I would be happy to. I will um, teach something that's called the self-compassion break that actually uses the three components of self-compassion to generate a self-compassionate state of mind. Okay, so maybe everyone can close their eyes, right? Um, so in, in order to experience self-compassion, in order for it to be real and not hypothetical, we actually need to call up a little suffering in our lives. So I'd invite everyone to think about some situation in your life right now that's causing some emotional difficulty. Okay, this may be a health issue, uh, something happening at work, a relationship issue. Um, and please choose something that's, you know, troubling, but it's not overwhelmingly difficult. We want to learn this skill without being overwhelmed. <laughs> so maybe some situation that's like a three or four on a scale of one to 10, but something that's really, you know, a problem. So taking a few moments to think about what you want to work with. Um, and calling the situation to mind, okay? So what's happening? You know, who, who are the people involved? Uh, what happened or what might happen? What are you afraid might happen? So really making the situation real and present for you. All right, then I'm going to be saying a series of phrases that are, again, designed to evoke these three basic elements of self-compassion. So the first phrase is, this is a moment of suffering. Okay, so basically we're bringing mindful awareness to the fact of the, the fact that this situation is really hard. It hurts, it's difficult. Okay, so I invite you to use any language that kind of validates this for you. Maybe something like, wow, I'm just really struggling right now, or this is hard. Okay, now the second phrase is designed to remind us of common humanity. So the second phrase is, suffering is a part of life. Right? In other words, it's not abnormal to have things like this happen. This is part of what it means to be a human being. So again, see if you can find language that really gives this message to yourself in a way that makes sense. For some people, this may be, you know, I'm not the only one who feels this way. Or this is completely normal. Whatever, whatever message you need to hear to remind yourself this is part of what it means to be human. Okay, and so the third element we want to bring in is kindness. So I actually I'd invite you to help us feel the kindness, maybe to put your hands on your heart or you can kind of cradle your face or give yourself a little hug if that doesn't feel too weird. Some physical gesture of kindness, maybe just holding your own hand, but really feeling the warmth of your own touch. And so the third phrase is simply, you know, may I be kind to myself in this moment? Right, I need kindness, this hurts, so I need some kindness and compassion. May, may I give myself the compassion I need in this moment? Um, but, but often it's a little difficult to know what to say to ourselves to express kindness. So an easy way to do this is to think, you know, what would you say to a beloved friend was struggling with the exact same situation you're struggling with. 
right? Think about what words of support and kindness you might use with your friend and also kind of the warm tone of voice you might use with your friend. And then just try it on with yourself. See what it feels like to be as kind to yourself in this moment as you would naturally be to a close friend. Okay, and then letting go of the phrases, you can put your hands down. Um, so just to say people will be having a variety of experiences. Um, some people will actually be feeling self-compassion. Um, sometimes when we give ourselves love, we immediately think of all the conditions under which we are unloved. And sometimes the reaction can be opposite. So just to say, if any of your listeners are having that reaction, know that it's part of the process. Self-compassion can feel a little awkward at first and actually sometimes even bring up uncomfortable feelings. So, you know, it's all okay. The idea is we're just planting the seed of kindness with ourselves and then just seeing what, what springs naturally. We're just nurturing the process without clear expectations of I'm supposed to feel a certain way. It's important to say that. Well, thank you so much for this beautiful meditation. And thank you for all your work and information. And I think uh, we wish you the best to spread this beautiful mission work to help many, many, many people to free from their sufferings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you.